So it's 11. Um, this is These office hours are um, a bit more informal than what we did on Tuesday. It's more of a, an opportunity for us to just have a discussion um, and for um, you all to, to share your own thoughts and opinions, tools, solutions, um, whatever you have to offer. Um, so uh, we can go ahead and, and get started. Um, if you weren't here on Tuesday, again, I'm, I'm Josh, uh, Josh Drake. I work at Indiana University Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research. And um, I am a, a security analyst. I do a bit of project management and I, um, a, a background in systems administration and network administration um, and some data center management. So um, I know a little bit of about a lot of things um, and I'm sure that uh, a lot of you are going to have more in-depth knowledge on on many topics than I do. So I, I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, what you have to say in this uh, in this arena and um, George is here and he's going to take some notes for us I think. Uh, our so I'm moderating the call, but if you want me to okay. take notes, I can I can also do that. Well, um, I'll try to keep some notes. Uh, I can't type too much without overwhelming my microphone, mm -hmm. uh, my clacky keyboard. But um, mm -hmm. if there's anything interesting, I'd like to sort of try to document. So I've got a little notepad up that I'll try sure. to keep some stuff on too. So. Morning, Ken. He may not be connected to voice yet. So. Now we've got one more in the waiting room. Yeah. Um, maybe there's an issue because uh, it's uh, it's stuck in joining for oh, something happened. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, so was uh, everyone at, at the talk on Tuesday or? Yep. You, you can use your, uh, you can unmute yourself or you can use your uh, buttons in Zoom to respond. Uh, yeah, so everyone is, um, is muted by default, but uh, okay. feel free to unmute yourself or even uh, enable your video because like this will make like, the engagement a little bit better, I think. Uh, so if you want to have your video on, feel free to do that. Um, and also, like, whenever you have questions, feel free to unmute yourself and, like, jump in. Yeah, so um, my anticipation for this uh, 45 minutes or so is that um, we would have a discussion. Uh, if you want to ask questions, um, I will try to answer it to the best of my knowledge. Um, or try to hook you up with someone uh, who can give you a more in-depth answer. Um, and if you have uh, any comments on what we talked about on Tuesday, um, I'd love to hear them as well. Um, I did sort of go through the uh, chat logs and uh, uh, some of the discussion that happened on Tuesday, and I, I came up with these sort of topics that I thought would be more uh, more interesting to go into today. Um, so one thing that came up um, was uh, using uh, vulnerability scanning to um, check for patch application um, and to see if you were actually remediating the vulnerabilities that you intended to remediate. Um, so that's something we go into more de detail about. Um, the other topic uh, I think that um, you know I'm, I've been pretty interested in recently and I think it's where a lot of this is going is using configuration management tools um, to do your patch management. And so um, if anyone has thoughts on or experience with Ansible, Puppet Chef, or Salt Stack, um, any of those sort of tools, I'd love to hear about them. Of the, uh, the, the the silence there. <laughs> I, I, I was just getting myself back to an actual place where I could sit and turn video on. But, um, I figured if I waited long enough, someone would speak. Someone would talk. That's right. That's how that's how it works usually. Um, certainly, I mean, I, I've gathered with the 
discussion you did on Tuesday, I mean, there's quite a wide variety of people and the responsibilities of the people that are in this workshop. Mm -hmm. um, I, I work at a academic HPC center. Um, so research computing side of things, not central ITS. Uh, so not to say I don't have to deal with a lot of it, but you know, patching and all of that is uh, very much still still an issue and, and responsibility that falls to me to some extent. Um, but all of my experience falls outside of more of the or away from the enterprise side where things are a little different in the ways things get done are slightly different. Um, We've used Puppet for many years now, and we're almost an exclusively a Linux shop, with one exception. Um, and you know, forcefully making everything have configuration management via Puppet, and all of that, and we do Ansible too in certain cases, uh, has been very helpful for the ease of you know in ensuring things are updated or changes get made across everything. We you know, lived the experience of everybody in the past of one machine that somebody set up always falling behind because nobody else knew it even existed. And then of course, that's the one that gets compromised. And you ask, wait, what does that machine even do? I've never heard of that before. Um, so, you know, getting, getting the organization and, and in our case, our organization is a small group of like 15 people for the research computing side, uh, again, separate from the enterprise IT and the larger university. Um, but getting everybody on board with that and really enforcing its use has been a has been a major help in having less of those unknown issues crop up. Of course, that doesn't mean to say, you know, automatically patching things is something Puppet is really designed for or capable of doing right out of the box. You have to really know what you're doing and you know we want to have a specific version of a package or say or be daring and say latest and then you know suffer when things get updated when you don't want them to uh, you know all sorts of complex plumbing can be added to roll things out in a testing manner first and um before you know you roll out across a thousand machines in a large cluster um so it, it certainly doesn't solve all of the problems but uh, i don't know if if anybody has similar stories or questions about, you know, using config management tools like Puppet or Chef uh, in, in the way that they've, they help with patch management and the whole process in general. Um, uh, we could have a conversation here, I guess. Yeah. Um, do you work with Jeff Dost? Oh uh, yeah, I know Jeff. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you work on Open Science Grid? Yeah. So. Okay. I was just curious. I'm on the security team for Open Science Grid. So. I, 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 do, I recognize the names. <laughs> yeah. He's, like, he's at UNL and he, he does HPC. I bet, it's, I bet that's what Yeah, yep, yep. I'm, I'm, I'm with, I'm with the, the Holland Computing Center and, and I do the CMS Tier 2 side of things, actually. And Yeah. We, interestingly and, enough, uh, we actually run our open VAS scans out of your... Um, yeah, yeah, I know. I'm not, <laughs> so. I, I, w I was the one that was questioning. Wait, why are you doing that first? So, so yeah, since yeah. you're here and and I have this opportunity, um, sure. we, we missed the glaring uh, hole here with IPv6 uh, right now. Anvil, where you are planning on running things, has no IPv6, so you're missing that entire <laughs> segment. Um, yeah, I I, I, it, with John or Derek moved to making it on a, on a different thing that has IPv6, but that, that could perhaps be an interesting topic for people to you know, bring up and, and realize there's an entire separate section of the internet and, and way of doing things that is currently being overlooked in a lot of places, especially when it comes to, you know, what services are running and how they're exposed. That's a good point. Um, yeah. Uh, that is something that, you know, a lot of times when, um, and this may be getting too far into the security weed yeah. side of things, but when you're doing enumeration for uh, your own site or another site that you're looking at for, for uh, penetration testing, like IPv6 is, is sort of the neglected, uh, neglected aspect of that. But I'm, I'm curious with um, your puppet uh, setup there. Um, so have you looked at, are you just using sort of like the open source um, puppet that comes out of the box and doing your own uh doing your own yep. setup and manifest okay are you using any modules for patch management that work with puppet 
Um, none specifically oriented towards patch management. No. So the, the the patch management side of things would be largely, you know, purposeful or intentful modifications to existing things. Um, to add, you know, either add software or update or require mm -hmm. versions, etc. Do you do anything along those lines? So the thing about being in, in my sort of role is that I don't get to have any of my own infrastructure. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just always uh, consulting with others uh, on, on different methods of doing things. And so um, while I tend to be aware of a wide breadth of, of what's available out there, I don't get tend to be able to work real deeply with any one, one tool or product. So um, in that aspect, I kind, of, I kind of miss that. I have to rely on my home lab. Um, for, for getting getting to new new services. Uh, but um, is anyone that might be using Puppet out there, have has anyone looked at or had experience with using their remediation product? I think it's called Puppet Remediate. I'm guessing that's a no. <laughs> It's just something I came across uh, when I was, I was doing a little bit of research for this talk. Um, they have, it basically lets you take uh, known vulnerabilities or you can feed it scans from tools like Tenable and Nessus and um, uh, apply workarounds or uh, packages uh, or KBs to fix specific vulnerabilities. And then you get a nice um, report afterwards of, of what was done, the actions taken, and um, you can sort of view a timeline of detected vulnerabilities and remediations that were applied. Um, I, I believe it's probably only part of the enterprise package. So you got to pay for support for that. But. And so is anyone doing their own, um, does anyone scan their own resources um, currently for uh, vulnerabilities um, using any sort of Nessus or OpenVAS or uh, Rapid7? Okay. So we we did, or I did, um, because we have a segregated network, so to speak, from the rest of the university, or at least certain um, parts that are. Uh, and then it was offloaded to the university because they were already doing Nessus um, largely, at which point then we had a big shakeup with how the IT department worked and joined, you know, with four universities all joining together, management changes, leadership changes. And so that's uh, up in the air again currently. They've switched to um, what is Palo Alto's fancy tool that they're pushing. At least I, I want to say it's owned by Palo Alto. I can't think of the name off the top of my head uh, of what tool is currently being used, but I'm actually while you were giving your talk on Tuesday was uh, setting up uh, OpenVAS or, or GVM. Uh, I'm trying to figure out still what, you know, the, where the difference is between what is the free open stuff and what is the commercial side. Um, but yeah, you want the uh, community edition. Um, yeah. And I think it's GVM 20 now where they, they change the numbering on it. I think it's, I think the current one is a lead. I think there's another one right? after 11 and they changed oh, the geez. versioning scheme, it seems, as of like this month. So, yeah, I know they, it's no longer branded as OpenVAS, right? They, they changed it to Greenbone. Um, so, but yeah. Uh, on that topic, maybe my long winded way of coming around to this, um, I'm curious, being from the non enterprise side where we don't just throw money at whatever problem and say, you know, we, we have a, we have a, somebody to point a finger at and we pay them to point the finger at them or to be able to point the finger at them. Uh, we always rely on open source free tools uh, for the research computing side. And I've looked at various things like, you know, we, we do Zeek for as an IDS and we have the various public feeds that I've cobbled together, which may or may not be of any good quality or relevance. And I'm curious the same, if the same is true with like OpenVAS uh, as far as the freely available uh, feeds and you know resources that are are consumed to do the vulnerability scanning, what what is what's the state of that or your opinion on are those usually good enough or is there a large gap in you know capability between what commercial solutions get you versus what you can get for free? 
It's a good question. I haven't used some of the larger commercial services, so my experience basically comes down to Nessus and OpenVAS. Um, I don't find much of a difference. Um, certainly, the ease of use, I guess, is a little bit better with the commercial products. Um, sometimes the documentation surrounding the reports you get is is better on the commercial products, I think. Um, but you know, we've we work with some partners that deploy OpenVAS on a very large scale um, out of Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. Um, they're they're running the Viz uh, vulnerability identification service, and they're using OpenVAS as their primary scanner. Um, so I think if you have, uh, you know, I don't want to say a lot of expertise, a little bit of expertise, or a little bit of willingness to um, do some research, uh, then I think you can get just as good of a, a set of um, uh, you can identify your vulnerabilities just as well using the, the free tools, the open source tools as you can with the commercial tools. Um, but you, you are going to have to do spend more time, I think, on the triage side. Once that report comes out, it's going to be more difficult to determine what's relevant to your environment when it actually represents a, a risk uh, for your environment than it would be with a commercial product. That's my opinion anyway. I'd be interested to know if anyone else has experience with those commercial products and, and has an opinion. I can add that uh, your last comment there of you know knowing the, the amount of human effort and time that goes into knowing what is relevant and what isn't uh, applies to the commercial side as well because you know, I've dealt with getting reports from our central IT people um, and they you know essentially pass on whatever Nessus or something else told them in a lot of cases it's technically true but technically irrelevant and you yeah. know, have conversations of Yes, the Apache version screen yeah. starts with a small number in you know old versions of L7, but really it has been patched against these vulnerabilities. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times, things like that get lost in the commercial side as well as, and it's it's time consuming from a from a from an FTE perspective to you know, deal with all of those. Yeah, six hundred pages of triple dies <laughs> alerts and stuff like that. No one is really too upset about. Um, so uh, in terms of um, the rest of you here on the call, I'm interested to know what your sort of environments are like uh, and what you're doing for patch management. If you have questions, if you have um, thoughts about where you'd like to go in the future, um, we do have some folks here who, um, you know, have a lot of knowledge. And so it's a great time to, to list those questions or share what you're planning and see if you can get some feedback on. Um, Well, I guess I'll go since no, <laughs> I'm right now. So, you know, I'm working with Gage. I'm fairly new. They've only been there, you know, three or four months. And from what I can tell, we're not doing any kind of patch management, which is <laughs> a little nerving to me because I come from a K-12 environment for 15 years where that's a whole nother set of <laughs> complications there. But so I was just kind of curious why I'm joining all this patch management stuff to see what everybody else has kind of got going on in their environment. So most of what I came from was with Windows and Mac OSs, so I can do SCCM and Jam patching pretty well. But like Linux and all the other stuff, I have pretty uh, pretty low knowledge on. So I was just kind of curious what's going on in those realms. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can implement something here because it's kind of scary that we don't patch anything as far as I can tell, unless something comes up on a one-off <laughs> basis. <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll get you there, Scott. Yeah. That first, uh, that first open VAS scan we give you guys is going to be really fun to look at. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, Jeremy. Hi, uh, this is Jeremy from Rutgers. Um, I uh, used to be an infrastructure person. I've now converted to HPC. So mm -hmm. uh, yay to that. But um, my question is, is not necessarily about patching per se. It's more about regression testing because it seems like a lot of HPC software has interdependencies and things that need to be checked when you update a library. So how do uh, you or other organizations kind of handle that in a place where patching can't just be just every week, just update the system and just reboot and you're fine? Um, I don't have a good answer for that. <laughs> I'm curious, uh, Garen, if you, if you have thoughts. 
the the question if i can try to reiterate it was what do you do in cases where you can't patch in a timely manner is that no i mean like like if you have software that kind of depends on certain libraries or, or whatnot um and that you want to make sure that when you upgrade the pa uh, python library that everything still works what do you do to kind of make sure do you put that in a staging area do, do you you know how much regression testing do you do before you take that live and, and put that on a cluster that's one of those things i guess you can always wave your hands and say uh you know business impact decision you know how, how how impactful is it if if things break i'm always on the you know uh, i don't have a cowboy hat on but i'm certainly that type of person who is the the go forward and make the changes uh beforehand and if it breaks then react and and figure it out then because otherwise progress doesn't get made uh, I can't speak on the like the Windows and the Mac patching side, but at least for an HPC cluster like the ones we operate, um, we try to a hard extent to stick with stock, you know, OS provided uh, libraries and and services to help eliminate some of the you know dependency issues. Um, and then of course there are always cases where you have to do newer versions of things. I mean, Python is, of course, one of those big ones, especially with Red Hat and trying to go from Python 2 to 3 and all of the fun that's there. Don't get me started on Ruby. Um, the We don't actually really do a separate like dev prod or dev test and prod environments for the, the you know, HPC type resources. Um, it's largely, you know, a few example jobs that we often, you know, if we do a big upgrade or a big change of versioning on software, we, we run some tests of well-known applications that people do and we say, yep, it's good. Uh, and then the flip side, and this is really built over the last like 20 years of doing this, uh, we have people on staff who are really good at figuring out the issues. And I, I want to say, I don't want to say that we don't care about the testing and breaking people's stuff, but as an academic side and a research computing side of um, of the you know the, the IT game, we have the ability and the flexibility to break people's things and not you know feel like oops, somebody's you know losing money and and somebody can't get to their bank records or something like that. That's you know really pressure and time critical. Um, so so we abuse the fact that we're not a critical IT department in that sense uh, to, to let us be a little more willy nilly with the patching uh, and, and keeping, th letting things get out of date. And, and it, sometimes it becomes a, you know, where, where do the, where does the most demand live? If there are people who need a old version of something that, but you know, common sense says we upgrade this to a newer version that the majority of people will benefit from, then uh, the, the exceptions get made for the ones that need something older or, or the newest, you know, bleeding edge thing. And they're kind of one off cases that we have to deal with. It, it certainly happens regularly and with almost all the software, you know, in different areas and different packages, different science disciplines. It, it's a, it is a continuous thing that really needs people that know what they're doing thrown at it, in my opinion. And thankfully we have that here. I know, I know that's not how a lot of environments are. So maybe I'm not even in a position to give you a great answer on that one simply because. So, so the answer is engineer a technical process that, that allows you to do this, but also engineer the people so that you can work, like, yeah. get, get some flexibility to, to fix problems as they come up. Ab absolutely. Yeah. yeah stay, my, stay in the, stay in the research sector so you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, in my experience, changing the people is the hardest part. People just don't want to accept change or patches or anything that might disrupt them. Even if it's only for five minutes, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think you create a, a culture around that. Go ahead. Jeremy. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, that that's been my biggest adjustment from infrastructure to HPC is that, you know, infrastructure wise, you could, you know, have multiple uh, IPs out there and, and just, you know, flip things over and no one kind of knows that things have moved. Uh, but when you're talking about research nodes, you know, rebooting when, when they're running a 24 by seven job is, is a thing. So, mm -hmm. um, just trying to maintain uptime and not break their stuff. I think a part of that too, and I mean, we, we're at a, we're not a huge supercomputing center, but we're at a, a considerable size, you know, multiple large resources, all sorts of different disciplines. And 
users that ran, ran the full gamut of, you know, help me with a, a Jupyter notebook. I've never touched the Linux command line in my life to the people that basically have their own clusters as well, but also use ours. Um, we, we have, for instance, a, the biggest resource is still rail six based and by golly, we're running that until <laughs> November. <laughs> and, and that's going to be the, uh, you know, the, the hammer, <clears throat> the clue bat that we hit people with say, no, this is changing now. I don't care if you're in the middle of a research paper, you know, end of life software at the OS level is, is, is a, is an easy one to just say, nope, it's changing. Uh, and in some cases we, you know, rely on, or rather I being oftentimes the person who gets to be the bearer of the bad news or just tell people no, even if they are trying to throw money at us or, are, you know, high profile faculty members. Um, we rely on more of our central ITS IT policies, which do, you know, there are a, a nice set of rules and I don't say regulations, but the guidelines saying, um, you know, thou shalt keep things patched, thou shalt not run known vulnerable systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And from at least my experience in the research computing side of the university, if you cite or, you know, bring in central ITS a, a, as a excuse, even the most notorious faculty members will usually just be like, okay, fine, I guess we'll have to change how we do our research. Not pleasant conversations sometimes, but um, if, you, if you have a larger IT group that can drive and dictate what you know, the, the business policies around patching and vulnerability management are, then I would say try to rely on them somewhat maybe. Yeah. So basically, pass the buck. I'm all all for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's it's a it's it, it's a good. I don't know. It's good to have other larger entities that you can say no. They're saying that this is how it should be, and if you have a problem with me, you've got a problem with them too, uh, type of a thing. Agreed. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Jeremy. Thanks uh, for your input, Karen. Um. Let's see, if anyone has anything they'd, they'd like to bring up, go ahead and raise your hand or unmute yourself. Um, I was gonna say from the HPC side, um, gosh, that's a whole nother world from I think what uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of us are doing in um, more sort of, uh, you know, IT as a service for, for our end users. Um, there's a depth of complexity to that that, that goes beyond, um, sort of, you know, in a traditional setting, you would just, uh, pool your pool your hardware resources into different um, groups and actually have a you know test environment that could mirror your uh, production fairly closely and, and then test things and, and uh, stage them in, in smaller sections or pools based on the resources used but yeah HPC it's not really an option you also have uh, responsibilities more than it's more than just your own researchers using your your nodes, right? You have, um, you're providing resource, uh, computing resources to other entities to use uh, on a shared grid. Was that directed to me? Well, it's more of a comment, but yeah. <laughs> it, it, it is very true. And so, um, I mean, you with the involvement with the open science grid, certainly that's one component of it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, having a, I, I also do, networking where a lot of the hats and my one of my favorite things is to always remind people that you can have you know nice private ipv4 subnets and throw things behind that in a you know research computing environment but at the end of the day it would be insane to not treat even your most internal networks as the wild west because you're letting thousands and thousands of people from all over the planet run payloads on your machines I mean, mm -hmm. I, I always use the example of an Italian researcher, physics researcher at a coffee shop sitting in, you know, on his laptop, typing away, running, you know, executing payloads on my machines down in the basement below me. And I have no idea what it is. And if, if I don't treat him as hostile, you know, what's, what's the point of treating anybody <laughs> as, as hostile? I, I don't trust the people mm -hmm. on the own, my own campus because most of the uh, attacks or compromises we've had have been from, you know, within, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, with compromised user credentials and, and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, the, the having 
external dependencies or external users that rely on your resources compounds the problem, I, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, it, in a way, I think it's nice because it makes it easy to just treat everything as as you know exposed or or everyone the same it doesn't matter if you're a user or not a user it's you're you're treated the same as if you were you know coming from a unknown and untrusted place uh, yeah it make, makes it hard too but at least it makes that mental mental segregation easy you don't have to think of oh i've you know got my little private cordon group of users here and we're all very nice and happy and Nobody's bad here. Uh, <laughs> getting getting that option out of the head makes it uh, frees you up a little bit, I think. Mm -hmm. So just to just jump in as well and like follow up on, on what you're uh, just saying, would you would you consider like um, uh, patching vulnerabilities that uh, expose the system to the outside world more severe than patching vulnerabilities that can lead to exploits on the system by users? Or do you consider them like the same, the same level of uh, like uh, uh, importance? I would say, I we would consider them the same level of importance, um, and it maybe is a testament to the fact that we are often lazy and bad with the whole management and um, you know vulnerability management patching uh, because certainly we, you know, things come and surprise us. Every now and then we're like, oh, wow, I forgot that was there. And I, oh, I didn't know that was vulnerable. Uh, a recent one we had, we have a, we teach classes using uh, an OpenStack cloud that we have and we run Apache's guacamole. It gives you a nice, you know, web, basically like a virtual desktop or VNC session through a web browser. It's, it's low, low effort for end users. So students love it. Um, yeah, we've been running a, one of those servers for, I guess it had been going for multiple years and had a bunch of recent exploits announced in March and we'd completely spaced on it and forgot that it was even a thing. <laughs> Somebody came along and thankfully told us after the you know vulnerability scan caught it and said, hey, what, what are you guys running here? This is, this is really old. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that being a, you know, coming from external, which it would have been exposed externally, you know, to the wider, oh, great, my lights just turned off, um, <laughs> wider world. Uh, I don't think I would view that as less or more critical than say, you know, things like user, ex, user level privilege ex, ex, excuse me, <laughs> escalations, there we go. Yeah. Easy for you to uh, say. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> on, uh, on, you know, the Linux clusters. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in a sense, you can, I suppose, contra contrary to what I just said before, you know, trust the, your limited set of users on the internet, or ex excuse me, your limited set of users on a cluster that, you know, mm -hmm. interactive command line, whatever, or executing payloads from open science grid jobs. Uh, you, you can trust them a little more in the sense that there are fewer of them, you know. Yeah. And sure, there could be a bad actor and they can really wreak havoc quickly, but it's also fewer fewer people than if it's, you know, the wild west of the internet where somebody's brute force scanning for this vulnerability across the swaths of the internet. Um, yeah. I think in most cases, I would say that, you know, it's, it's a higher priority to patch your external facing um, your external facing hosts. Uh, but yeah, in the, in the instance of like an HPC where you're allowing literally thousands of, of external users to have credentials to run jobs on your system, um, you have to worry a lot more about uh, the internal uh, lateral movement, use cases, things like that. We've seen in Open Science Grid, right? We have uh, OSG Connect, which basically if you, you do a little FaceTime with our um, team, you can get a uh, get credentials to run jobs on the grid. And so policing those accounts can be um, challenging because um, those credentials that you're giving out that then can uh, access your HPC resources, um, you know, there's, you don't necessarily have the same level of control over those identities as you do if they're coming from a research institution. You're basically allowing the PIs for the projects to vet the users and, and the credentials. And so yeah, you're essentially, you know, the, the concept of minimization that we talked about is almost something that is not possible to maintain um, because you're, you have so many open doors um, that you're much better off just trying to com 
compartment every different aspect of your operation so that um, you contain whatever inevitable breaches are going to happen. Um, I don't want to touch, we have, we have 10 or 15 minutes here, but um, so one thing that I was curious about, I know we did a poll and it came back that a lot of uh, the people on Tuesday's call had mixed environments of, of Windows and uh, Linux servers. Um, is anyone using a, a central tool to handle your um, package management or patch management on both sides of that? I know there's a few out there, but uh, I don't, I don't have any uh, knowledge of people that are, are really working with them. So if anyone has experience with that, could you speak up, please? Now, mm -hmm. so is anyone using the salt stack in any of your environments? Jeremy has salt. Yeah. Do you use it? Uh, well, you probably don't have any win Windows devices in HPC Center, so it's that'd be irrelevant. But um, what what's your experience with Salt been? If you're still uh, connected with voice. Sorry about that. Uh, high learning curve, much like any configuration management system. Um, mm -hmm. But when, once you get over the, the naming convention and whatnot, it's just as flexible as Ansible. Um, it's nice because it has an agent, so state is safe. Um, and you can do pretty much anything you want. I haven't done anything Windows. It's all Linux. I, I figured in your environment. Um, do, do you, with, with Salt, um, is that using YAML or is that use, um, oh, I forget what the other one's called. Um, it uses YAML. YAML, and okay. Ginger too. Yeah. It's all Python based. You can write your own modules if you want. Uh, and are you using the open source version of that? Yeah. Do you yeah. have enterprise support? Okay. Um, and when you say like it was difficult, uh, is it the initial setup that's difficult or is it just getting over the, the sort of change in mentality um, well, and it, learning it, the tools? Yeah. So if you're going from someone who has never run configuration management to running salt, there's going to be mm -hmm. a high learning curve because there's just configuration management isms that you need to learn. If you're mm -hmm. familiar with Puppet or CF Engine or something like that, learning salt, you, you just have to get over the naming convention and then you'll figure mm -hmm. out, oh, okay, this is how it works. Interesting. Yeah, I know Salt has become popular um, because it can also handle with the agents, it can handle Windows uh, endpoints as well. Um, but I think you're, you're end up paying a lot of money if you go down the Windows side of things because you have to have an enterprise license. Well, I would say for Windows, you have Active Directory. Why not mm -hmm. use it? Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, I found that, you know, I have, I have a bit of experience in Windows data centers. I found that um, the Windows tools that are available, Active Directory, and then you can plug in a, a WSUS server to that. Um, exactly. they, work, they work well, but WS, right, it, it has sort of this problem of, I've approved my patches and they're ready to go. And there's no more way to enforce um, the clients to check in and download things. So if you're, um, it's a good place to start, but I've, I've always found that like the amount of like, custom scripting you have to do on top of that um, with PowerShell or, or some other uh, yeah, execution you method. Use, you can also use, uh, depending on what hardware you're using, a Dell case is actually a really nice product as well. Um, it mm -hmm. has an agent, you know, much like Salt would run on a Linux box. So um, I know that you can push out stuff at least to Dell's and I think that they support other OS's or other hardware. Um, I'd, I'd have to look, but um, it's a really nice product that, that does that, not only just for Windows updates, but for programs as well, like Firefox, you know, mm -hmm. all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's something I forgot to mention on Tuesday is, is case. Um, yeah, and you can definitely push out. I had, um, I had case running with some uh, HP servers. So it definitely does work in that way. <clears throat> I think it can do Linux as well, but I don't know if I'd ever do that. Yeah, I've, I've never tried that. Um, I have a, a bit of experience with SCCM. I think, Scott, you said you do too. Um, and what I found with SCCM is that it's extremely powerful, but um, the setup is is pretty yeah. onerous. Yeah, it's a beast, but um, it works well once you get it going. But we try to patch 38 to 40,000 Windows devices a month. It's just, I haven't found a solution yet that would do that. <laughs> it's just too many in the way we were using it. But once you, the same thing with probably salt and stuff, once you get all the terminology and the stuff 
down pat and you can create your different patching strategies. It, it works pretty well, but it does take initial setup and strategy. You can't just throw it in place and hope for the best. <laughs> yeah, it's not like Ansible where you can just throw a playbook together and be like, hey, it works. <laughs> no. <laughs> is, it, is anybody using Ansible on Windows? Um, I know you can. I'm just curious if anyone's doing that. Seems like a no. <laughs> so, uh, we've got the five minutes left. Windows, dude. <laughs> I, I I believe it, and that's that's a good thing. I can't believe I spent that long in that world. <laughs> so we got five minutes left. Uh, if anyone has any topics they'd like to introduce or, or bring up, but please do so. If if no one else has a question, I just I I, I wasn't in the call yesterday uh, on Tuesday, so I apologize, but. What's the best recommendation now for, I mean, obviously security updates need to be applied immediately, right? But for yeah. the stuff that isn't, what's the recommendation? Is yeah, so it we, a day, a week, a month? We talked about this a little bit on Tuesday. Um, the guideline I, I gave in that call, um, I think is based on severity, right? So security, critical security updates within 24 hours or as soon as possible. Um, high level severity, uh, I'd like to shoot for 48 hours and then medium level 30 days and low level tickets six months. Okay, that sounds yeah. about right. Awesome, thank you. Um, Josh, maybe I missed uh, your response or like somebody else's response, but uh, there is uh, Chris uh, Medling, uh, Medling, sorry, on chat asking whether is anybody uh, has looked uh, at HP1 view. Um, I do not have any experience with HP One View. Is there anyone that has, has used or looked at that tool? Mm -hmm. Is that a similar tool to um, the Dell case? I'm guessing. Or is it Open View? Just doing some quick searching. Uh, one view IT management software. I think OpenView is something different because I used to run that my old job. Okay. That, yeah, I don't have any experience with the with the HP uh, One View. Um, to be I'll put it on a list to do some research on. Yes. Yeah, all right. I don't. I don't think um, we have any any knowledge sure. on that. Chris, did it have like a, any interesting features that you would like to share, like as uh, highlights from HP One View? Since you said uh, you, you you use it, something. Um, if Chris is going to type it in, so I'm not sure, but. Uh... Has ability to manage non-HP hardware. Okay, um, yeah, it looks like it does uh, some scanning and can handle hardware, uh, BIOS level firmware updates as well as um, packages and uh, updates for uh, operating systems. So that's that's interesting tool, similar to Case, I think. Um, so one thing that we we touched on just briefly on Tuesday, um, and I think about thirty people had some. Uh, some ICS infrastructure that they supported. Um, does anyone have any uh, thoughts on uh, keeping your uh, ICS stuff up to date? Or any OT facilities? I know, Scott, you guys have some OT infrastructure. Like I said, I don't think we really do. <laughs> it's something maybe critical comes up, we might do some, but I haven't seen anything yet where we have any kind of plan or anything. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't. Yeah, I'm not familiar with um, the other names in here in terms of, of what sort of your projects are about. But um, so we did. A, there's a webinar that we did for Research Sock back in oh geez um, February where we had um, the. Uh, 
CISO at CERN come and give us a talk about OT um, vulnerability management. Uh, if you go out to the Research SOC website, uh, that's out there. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, he's a pretty engaging speaker, Stephen, um, I forgot his last name. I'll put a link to that in chat here in a second. Um, yeah, so if you go back to the, the webinars, you can find the uh, download for, or the YouTube video for that presentation, which was um, uh, Stephen, uh, Stefan Luders from CERN um, and Phil Salki, who runs a, an OT um, uh, industrial control systems company. And they gave us a lot of pointers on how to manage uh, vulnerabilities in operational technology. So if you have any of that in your environment, um, I think it's worth taking a look at. Scott, you might find some some good stuff in there that relates to Gage. All right. So um, I'll give another comments for if anyone has a, a topic or a question. Um, I think we'll uh, wrap things up here at about uh, ten till. I have a problem. A one that would be too big of a topic to actually go in and, and wrap up in that time frame, but I, I want to maybe mention it anyway, just because it maybe plants the seed and gets people in a, a certain mindset. But I think all the things we've talked about now are in the light of, especially um, you know, remote scanning and you know, over the network essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a whole new, well, at least it's new to me. Maybe it's not new to the computing industry and, and academia. Uh, area of scanning, you know, applications themselves for vulnerabilities. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of this is in like, you know, with the big move to containers and Kubernetes or a lot of stuff, you know, <laughs> there, there's 10 million products today coming out that say yeah. oh, we'll scan all of your containers and your images. Um, certainly that's something we've been maybe not bad at, but we just haven't got around to it. Um, you know, we were in an OpenStack cloud where there's a whole set of, you know, images that sit there and people can install their own windows mm -hmm. VMs from uh, and we don't regularly you know scan the images themselves to right. verify yes they're, they're or have outdated software the same goes with things like singularity images if you're yep. like an hpc and stuff uh, yep. so that's that's a whole other yeah. area to consider and could be an entire presentation to talk on yeah. No, it, it's a big problem. And uh, if you're going to the OSG All Hands, um, then come and talk to me and Mike Stanfield about that because uh, we it's a it's a problem that as a security team for OSG we are thinking about a lot um, as we move more and more to containers. And so I, I talked about containers on Tuesday a bit and how uh, you can set up some basic hygiene for your containers. Um, but in terms of finding a tool that works well. Um, for actually scanning the content of containers and making sure that the content, you know, the images are secure. Um, there's nothing good that I found. Um, there are tools out there that will do it, but they produce so much noise that you might as well just review them by, uh, you know, manually. Um, and so if, if anyone finds a solution to this, I think they're going to make a lot of money. and <laughs> It's going to be uh, pretty useful. Um, you know, we're working with the, the people over at Slate who um, have, have done this. Um, uh, sort of to create an infrastructure at the, you know, service layer at the edge is what Slate stands for. And so they're doing that all in containers. And, um, they're allowing the community submit containers to do different functions. And so triaging those and uh, vetting them is a big, you know, right now labor intensive process. So no, I don't have an answer, but it's something we're thinking about and talking about a lot. Um, the, uh, yeah. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't have an answer either. And I didn't expect one. I just wanted to make a comment <laughs> about it. The, the one temporary patch or band-aid solution to it in my mind that I've put some effort into here at UNL at least is automating the instantiation of these, you know, VMs. So for OpenStack images or containers and then making sure scans go regularly against those. So at least you have the, you know, it's kind of put it into production and then see if it's, see, see how vulnerable it is with the existing scanning frameworks. Um, not not perfect, but if you, if you can automate it, it's better than nothing, I guess. 
Yeah, we have been working on um, creating an automated scanning uh, platform for Open Science Grid so that we can scan the actual compute nodes across all the facilities. Um, and that has proven to be uh, both, in fact, was not terribly difficult to get going, but to triage the data that comes out of it, there are thousands of nodes. And um, I think the first time we ran the scan, we, we ended up with like 16 million packages um, that came out of that. It's just too much information to sort through. Uh, and so having that sort of stuff in some sort of organized system, um, you know, which is difficult, like in the HBC world, you develop your own tools for a lot of this stuff. So it's the Perl scripts um, that, you know, we, we are using that came from the, the guys in Europe that are doing the same same work. And, um, uh, there's just no good commercial solutions. So I think that runs true for a lot of the, the science community. Um, we are at 11.50, so uh, we're going to wrap things up. Um, it was great uh, talking with all you. Thanks for coming. And um, yeah, uh, we can speak more at the uh, All Hands, uh, Karen. So I appreciate all your. Sure, you and I will talk more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate all your uh, your input today. That was, that was great. Thank you too for this. This is great. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, George. Thank you all for joining. Bye bye.